All right, your questions have been collected, they've been tabulated, and I'm seeing them for the first time. It's time for Ask the Captain. All right, here we go. The first question is from Slideways. Can a belted passenger be injured by an unbelted passenger during severe turbulence? Yes. You know, if, if somebody doesn't have their belt on, they might go flying. Uh, they might end up landing on top of you. And so, yeah, could you be injured by somebody? That's why you want to keep your seatbelt on all the time. You don't want to be that person that goes flying. And you certainly don't want to have somebody land on top of you. It's considerate of the other passengers around you. That's probably the best way to put it. All right. Uh, John Jameson, 6082. Is it appropriate to give the cabin and flight crew a thank you card for a pleasant flight? Absolutely appropriate. Uh, I know a lot of flight attendants, they, they just love that when you hand them a little card. There's actually a things I think online that you can get at most big airlines that are like rewards for a crew. You can download those things and hand them to them. And I think they actually get points to go, you know, buy something in a company store. But uh, besides that, just a nice handwritten note is always a nice touch. And I've had many people over the years uh, hand me a note. And I've kept all of them, by the way. That's how important they are to me. I've got a folder at home. I put all the little nice notes, thank you notes over the years. And I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to retire here pretty soon. I might frame them. I don't know. That, that's a good question. I got to think about that a little bit, but yeah, absolutely do that. All right. Uh, Rosa Relly writes, how can a commercial aircraft fly on one engine if there is only thrust on one side? That's a really good question. Now, it's not as easy to fly on just one engine, but every commercial jet at whatever weight is rated to fly and even climb on a single engine. So on my airplane, there's a thing called the TAC, T-A-C. It's the Thrust Asymmetry Computer. And it adjusts the rudder appropriately for the loss of the one engine. Now, on the old airplane I used to fly, the 767 and the 757, they didn't have that thrust asymmetry computer. So the engines are out on the wings and they're not center lined, right? If they were right down the middle of the airplane, you wouldn't have to really adjust the rudder too much. But when one of those goes out, the airplane's going to want to go like this. So you got to counter with the opposite rudder. Uh, I had to do that with my leg physically. Now I could trim into it a little bit with the trim knobs and it would take a little bit of the pressure off. But boy, by the time you got all the way around and came back in maybe 15 or 20 minutes before you had a landing, man, was your leg hurting back in those days. That's what I love about the 777. It's got this tack in it and I don't have to push real hard on the rudder. Now I got to be aware of the, the pressures on the airplane, but the airplane will fly just fine with asymmetrical thrust out of just one engine. Yeah, now you know. Okay, excellent. All right, I've got Anna B to 6266. Who pays all the medical bills when you don't put your seatbelt on when told to do so and then get hurt? Well, I, you know, again, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I've never done that. And so I, I would think that your insurance company would work that out with you and uh, with the hospital. But uh, that's probably more of an insurance company question than it is me. But uh, why take that risk, right? If the seatbelt signs on, kids keep your seatbelt fastened, even if it's not keep your seatbelt fastened so you don't have to cross that bridge someday. All right, I've got uh, Milkovan Jana. That's a great name. Uh, I found out pilots will call moderate turbulence at best, no matter how bad it is, even if there are serious injuries. I heard it's because of some policy or paperwork. Is that true? And if so, why? Well, that's, that's a very insightful question. And the answer to that is it's, it's sadly kind of true. If I call something severe turbulence, it's a whole bunch of paperwork. There's a whole bunch of stuff that comes out of that. It's it's a road that, that nobody really wants to go down exactly. Now, I think it, it comes back to this. You have to have integrity. If you've gone through severe turbulence, write down severe turbulence. If it means more paperwork or more questions that you have to answer, you know what? That's why I get paid the big bucks. Call it what it is um, and let's be accurate with it. I've been through severe turbulence two times in my career. It's very, very rare. So it's not something that you would normally um, encounter. Most of it is moderate, but uh, you're right. You probably heard pilots are reluctant to call it severe. The, the, the um, definition of severe turbulence is you momentarily lose control of the airplane. That doesn't mean the airplane falls out of the sky. It means you hit hit the you know the bumps so hard that you know you're kind of doing one of these and the instruments are going all over the place and you know it's it's momentary the airplane goes right back in control but uh it's that edge it's that's a bump above moderate so that's really actually a very good question all right uh, william hoffman tutorials what do the pilots do while in cruise 
Um, I get that they chat and stuff, but what are they actually doing and monitoring in the flight? Uh, well, you're right. We do chat a lot, but uh, there's it's it's actually pretty busy most flights over to Europe. Uh, you know, when we're departing, we're talking on air traffic to air traffic control, and we're constantly domestically getting handed off from one frequency to another. So you have to listen up for that. So that's they're calling you on the radio. You don't want to miss your call. So your your ear has to be tuned to what they're saying to you. Uh, then in addition to that, we're calculating fuel, we're double checking our route. Many times that same air traffic controller, when they call you, will give you a shortcut. So they'll give you a point down the road, and then you got to go into the computer and verify that point with your co-pilot. Then there's what's called a cruise task che checklist that I go through, and I verify my mock speed, what altitude I want to cross the Atlantic at. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of other things on that checklist as well. Those are all things that, that keep us busy. I'm also double checking now my NOTAMs for the airport that I'm going to fly to. If I didn't give them a thorough look at before I took off, I'm going to do that in flight to make sure I'm legal to land at that airport. Are there any restrictions? Are there any higher, uh, minimums for the approach that I'm about to shoot or going to shoot in a couple of hours. So that's all stuff I'm looking at. Then I'm double checking the weather constantly, looking to see where the best altitude is, what the smoothest altitude is, what the best winds are, and making sure I'm not flying through moderate turbulence if I can avoid it at all. So there's quite a bit to go on, uh, but are there some like quiet spots? Yeah. And then the two of us kind of talk. That's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, Black Knight Chess. Uh, why, all caps, did the fasten seatbelt and life vest under seat, all caps, I don't know why you're shouting, but that's okay, uh, lights come on and flash, all caps, with chimes when I was a passenger on a commercial flight from uh, Orlando to Atlanta. I can tell you exactly why that happened. Because the captain went to reach up to turn this no smoking sign on or off. OK, and to chime the flight attendants for something. And he mistakenly grabbed the fastened seatbelt sign and did that. The reason that we do it with the no smoking signs, because it's not used anymore, but it does ding everybody in the back. And it doesn't bring on that automated voice on your screen that says the captain has turned on the seatbelt sign. Return to your seat and strap in, you know, that whole message. Every time I turn that fastened seatbelt sign, even if I do it just for a split second, that whole message comes back to you. So that's probably why you saw it flash. It was most likely a mistake. All right. So I've got a bunch of letters and numbers. Can't even pronounce this one. Can you explain why Antonov aircraft can fly with crosswinds of 100 knots and take off at 45 degree angle? Uh, how can this be possible? I don't know really much about the Antonov aircraft. Um, I know there's a crash recently. We, we covered it on this channel. Uh, are you talking about taking off? With a 100 knot crosswind, I don't think any airplane can take off with a 100 knot crosswind. You did say, can they fly with a 100 knot crosswind? Yeah, I can fly with a 100 knot crosswind all day long. Taking off and landing, that's a different issue. And it says, and take off at a 45 degree angle. That's pretty steep. Um, I, that's really steep. I'd have to look into that, but uh, you got me curious now. So I'm going to look this up afterwards and uh, maybe I'll learn something. And if it's worthy, we'll do a video on it. All right, great. Okay, next question is uh, Jake M3 uh, times 2M. I must be a mathematician. Small private aircraft seem to have the most crashes and problems. Why is that? Well, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true, but let's go with the premise that man, maybe they do. I'm thinking that smaller aircraft, the pilots just aren't, they don't fly as often. Remember, I'm a professional pilot who flies all the time, who's got world-class training on my airplane and tens of thousands of hours of experience. A lot of private pilots, they love their airplane. They're very good pilots, but they might only fly once or twice a year. Their proficiency just isn't the same. Then, you know, as a result, the airplanes are probably not quite as well looked after as they should be. And so that's a bad combination. I have a private airplane and I don't fly it that often. I only fly it a few times a year. So after retirement, I'm looking forward to flying more, but I would fall into that category with a small private aircraft. So I think that's probably the, the reason for the discrepancy. But that's a, that's a good question. All right. Fulsome McGinley, presumably there would be a fail safe that would not allow the valves to close in the event that the power failed. I think you're talking about Air India 171. And if we go back to those fuel cutoff switches and the fuel valves, uh, it is a fail safe system. Uh, if you had a total electrical failure on the airplane, those fuel valves that allow fuel to fuel flow to the engines, they are not going to close. They are going to stay in the open position. They're designed that way on purpose. The last thing you want, if you have a total electrical failure on the airplane, is for both engines to flame out because your fuel control valves 
closed. And so they are fail safe and they're designed that way. All right. So next question is uh, Joy uh, M19CR. Have you ever seen anything weird or unexplained while flying? Well, yeah, kind of a little bit. Sometimes weather formations are a little weird. You know, I think you're getting after the, have you ever seen a UFO? Not in the traditional sense of a UFO. Every once in a while, you'll be flying and something will go right by you real fast. Usually it's like a balloon. Like there was a kid's parade and there was a helium balloon that goes by. Uh, I've seen drones go by before. That's disturbing. Uh, and uh, I've also, when you go up in, when you fly through the Canadian Maritimes, there's a lot of those uh, satellites now and they're all in a row. And sometimes the sun hits them just right and they all kind of light up. And that looks weird. All those satellites lit up. And sometimes they, they, they come and go depending on how the sun's hitting them. And again, it might be totally black at night where you are, but the sun is hitting them from over here and you can't see the sun now and it causes them to light up and not light up. So it looks sometimes like they're moving around, but they're not, they're, they're actually stationary, but uh, yeah, it's a little, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I'll admit that. Um, probably the weirdest thing is St. Elmo's fire. St. Elmo's fire is static electricity on the windscreen of your airplane. And when you're going through certain weather conditions, uh, it'll start to crackle and you'll hear it like that. And it looks like mad science, right? It's like that across your screen. And wow, it, it'll it'll crack so loud sometimes that it'll, it'll really get your attention. Doesn't do anything to the airplane. Doesn't do anything to the windscreen. It just looks really weird. All right. Uh, Epperin writes this. My third grader wants to know if pilots need to know more math than the average person, what kind of math does a pilot do? Um, I, I would say probably, uh, I probably had to end up doing a little bit more math, uh, but I, you know what, honestly, the normal progression through algebra, calculus, trigonometry in between uh, is enough to be a, a pilot. Um, I don't use any of that stuff now uh, today. Most of everything is done by the computer like it is for all of the rest of us. But I do have to have a pretty good mind for arithmetic because I add a lot of numbers all the time and I have to do that, no pun intended, on the fly. Hey, did you get that? I have to do that on the fly. Like, let's say I'm, I've got a visual approach into a runway. There's kind of the three to one rule. So if I'm three miles away from landing, I wanna be in 300 foot increments at 900 feet. So I just do 300, 300, 300. I wanna be at about 900 feet, three miles from the runway. If I'm at five miles, I can be at 1500 feet, right? I just do the math real quick in my head. So be good at arithmetic. And here's the rule of thumb. If you wanna be a pilot someday, two things you have to do. Get good grades in school, because that opens up every possibility to you in life, including being a pilot. And the second is be good to your mother. Always be good to your mother. I'm not joking about that, right? Pilots are rule keepers. And if you can be good to your mother all the time, you'll make a good pilot. That's Captain Steve's advice. All right, Scrambler 390. Has the role of the flight engineer been totally dissolved? And when are, there, are they still in use? And what was their role? I was a flight engineer when I first got hired at my airline. I got hired. I was a 727 flight engineer. There were three pilots in the in the cockpit at that point, a captain, a first officer, and a flight engineer. I had a panel that I worked uh, back there because a lot of the stuff was mechanical back in those days, and they didn't have little black boxes to replace me. Now, most of the airplanes, all of them at my airline, there are no flight engineers left anymore. We've all been replaced by some computerized function. Are there still flight engineers out there today? Yes. Anybody that flies a DC-10, there's a flight engineer on a DC-10. Anybody that flies an older 747, there's a flight engineer on an old older 747. I think the 100, 200, 300 models had uh, flight engineers on them. Any old 727s out there have a flight engineer. So um, are their breed shrinking? Yeah, absolutely. But there are still some out there if they still fly those uh, airframes. All right, final question. David Indy, uh, given your preference, would you rather fly during the day or night and why? Wow, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Nighttime. And here's why. When I first fell into love in love with flying was at night. I was uh, a student in T-34 Charlies with the Navy. We, I had done maybe 10 or 12 hours worth of flying. I had gotten my solo in and the next phase of my flying was what was called night fams. And we did probably four or five nights in a row where we went up after the sunset and we flew around and it was beautiful. It was so tranquil and it was clear and you could see for hundreds of miles, all the city lights for as far as you could see. And it was just mesmerizing. And still at night, I still get that old feeling from the first time I flew at night. I, I, I just, now I got to pay attention to what I'm doing, but I, I do love to just stare out the window sometimes and look at all the beautiful lights for as far as the eye can see. Uh, that has never gotten old. That little 
kid part of me has never gone away. So excellent question. I had never thought about this until this moment, but yeah, absolutely flying at night is, uh, is what I prefer. All right. Great questions this time, folks. Really, you got them stacked up just right. I'm so glad. Hopefully we gave you some good answers. Keep them coming because we'll line them up again and we'll take off with the next episode of Ask the Captain.